Welcome to Sputnik, orbiting the world with me, George Galloway. And me, Gayatri. Britain's National Health Service, arguably the country's heart and soul, is in the deepest of crises. Led by the country's most unpopular politician, Jeremy Hunt, and there's a bit of competition for that position, locked in confrontation with hospital doctors, indeed the entire British Medical Association, employing the union-busting tactics of the US in the last century. Which may be appropriate because TTIP, if it is concluded, is likely to bring U.S. union busters right into the heart of the health service. Dr. Bob Gill of the Save Our National Health Service campaign is Britain's leading campaigner to do what it says on their tin, save the National Health Service. And I'm glad to say he joins us now. Dr. Bob, thanks for coming on board the Sputnik. Thank you. Just uh, paint briefly, if you will, the state of crisis that the NHS is now in? Well, there's been several years of continuous relative underfunding. Since 2010, instead of getting the traditional 4% funding increase, the NHS has suffered a 0.8% increase per year. So over time, this has had a significant effect on the resources available to the NHS, to the staff, and ultimately impacts on patient care. So the NHS is being squeezed dry of resource. And yet they said they had ring-fenced NHS funding. How does that work out? Well, that's a complete deception. They also said no more top-down reorganisation in 2010. And in 2012, we had the Health and Social Care Act, the biggest privatisation act the NHS has seen. But it's part of a 20-year sequence of steady uh, re-disorganisation. But this has all been deliberate because each new reform takes us further down the privatisation road. I, I'm glad you mentioned that longer period because it seems to me many of the NHS's problems now date back to the Blair Brown era. Or even further. Or even Thatcher. further. Thatcher era, uh, no? Even further, uh, yeah. Uh, kind of with me, it goes without saying that <laughs> most things are located, most problems are located in the Thatcher era. But the difference is this the Blair Brown era said that they had solved the NHS's problems mm -hmm. and that they had poured new money into it. But that was true only up to a point, wasn't it? Well, a lot of the new money went into setting up the infrastructure for the whole-scale whole handover of our NHS to American corporations. But you're right, the problem started much earlier than that, in 1988, by Oliver Letwin. He wrote a document called the... the uh, the Britain's greatest, big, Britain's biggest enterprise, where he set out the stages through which you could go through without the public noticing to get us to the US model. And unfortunately, Tony Blair, in his 13 years at the helm, followed the successive steps. But this was never told to the public because they can't get away with it. If the public knew what was afoot, they couldn't get away with it. So they had to disguise it in socialist jargon. He gave us the line, seven days to save the NHS before he got elected in 1997. In opposition, he talked about removing the market infrastructure, but actually when he got into power, he reinforced this. And he also took several steps which were major progressions in privatization. For example, breaking up the hospital network into foundation trusts which are like separate business entities. He saddled hospitals with PFI liability, private finance initiative liabilities. So the, go the government borrowed 11 billion from private banks and financiers, and we have to pay, pay back 80 billion. Now this is an, a deliberate financial millstone to justify the sale and breakdown of the NHS further along the line. And to finish things off, in 2009, they brought in something called the Unsustainable Provider Regime, which is a fake bankruptcy regime, bankruptcy uh, framework to justify closing hospitals. And that was the regulation they used to try to go for Lewisham Hospital. Yeah, I mean, the very idea of a hospital being bankrupt is so alien, it mm -hmm. might as well have come from mm -hmm. Mars. Uh, I drove past the Royal London Hospital just the other day, mm -hmm. Uh, I used to say when I was the MP there, uh, you would never find any member of the royal family in the Royal London mm -hmm. Hospital. But it looks very nice now. The PFI financed expansion mm -hmm. and development has worked out at £1 million per bed. Mm -hmm. And I don't know what their finances are like, but I do know there are many other hospitals in England mm. which are technically on the verge of or over the verge of 
bankruptcy. What does that actually mean in this context? Well, in order to justify further closures and attacks on the health service, they had to restructure it from a care delivering service to a business. And in order to say, that, well, this business is failing, you saddle it with these deliberate debts. And then you use those debts to close down what we publicly own, to flog off the hospitals we own, flog off the land, shrink the NHS, bring it to the point of collapse, and then say, well, the only solution is yet more of the privatisation. So it's quite a, quite a clever financial scam that's been pulled off. Well, clever if it, uh, if it works in the end. Uh, I just want to run that number past you again. Mm -hmm. Blair and Brown put 11 billion in, mm -hmm. but the public must pay 80 billion back that's right. to the private financiers right. of our national health service. Mm -hmm. That sounds to me like a crime, you know, a crime that you ought to actually be charged by the police. Well, interestingly, the Labour Party still are very reluctant to talk about PFI. There is some concern that some of these were illegally financed. Uh, there's something called the Ryrie Rules, which make clear that if you're going to go to the private sector, you need to make a cost-effectiveness, best value for money demonstration. But I don't think these loans, certainly they didn't meet those definitions, but the problem is you cannot look at these contracts because they hide behind commercial confidentiality. So we, we as campaigners, want to open up these contracts and, and look at them and see whether there is criminality. Even if there isn't criminality, mm -hmm. it's a crime what's been done sure. to what was Britain's crown jewels. Mm -hmm. We were the first in the world to develop uh, this kind of uh, framework for mm -hmm. uh, health care. And TTIP, if it comes about, will be that'll be the death knell, won't it? Well, that'll be the lid on the coffin. Well, it's a corporate power grab of all public services. And we have in charge of the NHS a gentleman called, called Simon Stevens. He needs to become a household name. He served the Blair government. He then went on to work for United Health while he was at United Health. United Health's a private health care provider. Yes, one of the biggest private uh, insurers for health care in America. While he was there, he campaigned against Obamacare, Obama's reforms. He campaigned sure. against those. Then he went on to campaign for TTIP to include health care. And now he's in charge of the NHS. So this is an extremely troubling development. But a lot of people who have been encouraged by the election of Jeremy Corbyn are still waiting to hear anything decent from the shadow health team. I, I went to a meeting with them a month ago and was looking forward to hearing something sensible from Heidi Alexander. But what we heard were narratives that fit into the ongoing privatization. She expressed support for Simon Stevens despite his track record. And the next stages of the privatization are to devolve the NHS budgets, to merge budgets with social care budgets, which have already been largely privatised, and then you will have contamination and you'll also have the entry point for patient charges, and then co-payments. So the framework is all there. The narrative from the Labour Party still supports privatisation, and we are desperate to wake up the leadership to what is going on uh, in the health team. Well, of course, uh, Labour's health spokesperson isn't uh, on the same page as mm -hmm. Jeremy Corbyn. She's one of the uh, people who, well, let's put it kindly, uh, is unpersuaded mm -hmm. of Jeremy Corbyn's uh, tenure. Mm -hmm. uh, but you must get through to Jeremy himself. Mm -hmm. This, that what you're saying would be anathema mm -hmm. to Jeremy Corbyn, I can tell you that, mm -hmm. on 40 years' experience. Uh, you must somehow, let's hope this programme does it, wake up the Labour leadership to the extent to which we're sleepwalking into all of this. Let me confess something, mm -hmm. some of which you've just said I have never heard before. And I'm a pretty switched on uh, guy in terms of politics. I did not know that this man was running the National Health Service, having worked in America against mm -hmm. Obamacare and for one of the world's biggest privatizers. So, your campaign's a pretty urgently needed one. This is, a, a, this is a 999 call. Certainly is. Simon Stevens, in my view, is one of the most dangerous men in public office. He's taking us in completely the wrong direction. We know that the American model is responsible for 45,000 preventable deaths a year. 
that's not a system I want to be around to see in this country. Um, unfortunately, as I've said, the shadow health team are still supporting Simon Stevens. I think we need to highlight, highlight the problems that he is posing for the NHS. And this is where the junior doctor's dispute exactly, comes in, yeah. actually. Yeah, she wanted to yeah. ask about that. Well, the junior doctor situation is completely contrived. It was never a negotiation. There was always the threat of imposition. There was never any new money. The doctors were not arguing for a pay rise. And there are no new staff. But what he wants to achieve is to break the unsocial hours payment so that the assets can be sweated. So when the private companies take over, they can abuse their junior doctors, but as a helpful side product to what they're doing is to push out doctors, to save on redundancy and to replace them with a downskilled workforce, a cheaper workforce, a more compliant workforce who will be more willing perhaps without the ethical binds that doctors have to overlook what will be far less quality care. It, we were turning medicine into conveyor belt medicine. The, focus of the private corporations will be for quick, easy, cheap, profitable activity. So they want to close down more a &Es, they want to close down more ITU units, and having a workforce crisis with their, which they have created will also help their argument to shut down more. And get your medicine from a vendor machine. Get your medicine from wherever, but you won't necessarily need to be medically qualified to be issuing medical advice. And this is the toxic um, undercurrent to all these reforms. And where do the consultants stand vis-à-vis -vis the junior doctors? Because they're also very often accused of getting nicely paid behind the, behind the scenes. Well, again, during the labour years, it was important to keep the medical profession quiet. And as a GP, we had a very good outcome in 2004 with our new contract. But what we also gave away was our control of general practice. So they split away out of hours care. Um, they also started to hive off and contract out for the first time in the NHS GP services. So you no longer had to be a GP or doctor to run a general practice surgery. Yeah. So anybody could do it. Ah, so you got Virgin. A bookie. A bookie could do it. You've got Richard Branson, who's the biggest GP in the country. He's got three million patients on his books. Ah, Dr. Richard Branson. Dr. Richard ah, Branson. Yes. So, I'd forgotten about him. <laughs> yeah. So This uh, is a truly extraordinary story that mm -hmm. you are telling, and if I may say so, mm -hmm. extraordinarily well. Uh, we've run out of time for now, mm -hmm. but I think you and I need to work together Certainly, uh, to yes. highlight this. Dr. Bob Gill, Save Our NHS campaign. Thanks for joining us Thank you on very the much. Sputnik.